Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to second session here today, uh, a session that I am very, uh, I'm looking very much forward to actually. Uh, uh, and please, Simon and Stephen, please uh, turn on your sound and camera so we can enjoy your pretty yeah. faces. <laughs> <laughs> morning, everybody. Uh, as, yeah, good morning. Good morning, yeah. morning everyone. As I, just, as I just said, I look particularly forward to this session because not only will, will um, HP tell us how inkjet is now re revolutionizing the commercial uh, print space but we have actually have Simon Cooper from solo press uh, uh, confirming that uh, statement and because you're living proof on this aren't you Simon that's right <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. that's why I'm here <laughs> yeah so uh we, we will i uh, think that during the show we'll see uh, a film we did with you last week and uh, and where you uh, actually uh, in my in my headline for this one i chose that uh, the you said that the t250 actually exceeded your expectations um it must be nice to invest in equipment that that you know you have good high expectations and then it's exceeded by it right Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, not to preempt too much of, of what we're going to be talking about, but um, uh, as you'll see in the video, yeah, that, that's definitely the case. Um, and I'd say the big concern we had was around quality. And, and that's the area specifically I was saying that um, our expectations mm. have been exceeded, which is which is wonderful. Fantastic. And you are and you are actually one of the first uh, customers with the T two fifty with the brilliant ink. Uh, so that is also like evidence that uh, that when HP moves uh, the quality perspective of inkjet to a new level, uh, yeah. there's you, you are you your customer that buys into that uh, mantra, right? Yeah, and not to be too precious about it, but we were the first customer. So just okay. the first customer. Morning, Alex. Yeah. Oh, he's done. Alex. Alex is having some trouble this morning. So uh, yeah. here he is. Good morning, now. Alex. Can you hear yeah, us? I had some technical challenges. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. We can. Yeah. I mean, uh, ye yesterday we had a, a wonderful full chat with uh, with Randy Vandergriff from Kodak, and as we said to him, it's good that you are doing uh, print heads and printers and not uh, uh, webinar uh, systems because his <laughs> sound was uh, completely <laughs> off all the time. So, I mean, it's good that we have the places that we're working, right? So. Uh, welcome very much to all of you. Um, uh, I think that this day will be very interesting. Uh, we just had a wonderful uh, presentation by Mark Freitag from uh, uh, Livonia Print in uh, in Latvia, and uh, he was actually talking about how uh, the workflow and the business ideas around it. But uh, uh, what can we expect from you guys today? Well, it's really just hearing a bit about the the commercial prints, where we where we stand in commercial print. But then it's principally about hearing about Simon's experience, everything that he went through, um, to uh, how he came to un uh, learn more about Inkjet and how he made the decisions for his company and his experience mm -hmm. uh, with the, with the press. Mm -hmm. So, um, should we get started with the with the, that video? So we have that as a talk track, and then we have, uh, or what do you? Or what should well, we do? I think we were going to do it all live this this morning, actually. So okay. if we can, maybe just uh, uh, Alex and I will introduce ourselves, and then we'll um, introduce Simon and actually run a, a little clip of of. Um, Perfect. Solo press as he's as he's talking. Perfect. So I will just uh, me and Jean, we will just get off camera right yeah. now, and oh. then basically uh, we will get back to you. We will be listening all the time, and then we can have a Q and A afterwards. Is that does that make sense? That makes that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, yeah. take it away, gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Morton. So uh, as I say, let's let's uh, make some introductions. Uh, so just very briefly, I'm I'm Stephen Goddard. I'm the uh, the category business manager for the uh, inkjet business, the page wide press inkjet business uh, in EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And my counterpart over in sales, Alex, is uh, is you. Yeah, so Alex Oldfields, I'm the EMEA sales manager for for HP on the page wide press business. As uh, as Stephen says, managing Europe, Middle East, and and Africa. And Simon. Hey, yeah. So uh, Simon Cooper, I'm the MD of uh, Solo Press. We're a commercial printer in uh, in the UK, in the southeast of, of England, a place called South End on Sea. Um, and yeah, I've been there for a couple of years, but the business has been around for for twenty years. Very good. Um, and uh, this looks good so far. <laughs> Are you going to play that video, Stephen? So am I? I am I? 
Am I commentating over this? this Yeah, well, we see a... I think the idea is you're commentating over it. Okay, so this is one of our Litho um, press halls. Um, we, yeah, we're, we're, we're Litho and uh, digital printers. Uh, we, prior to the investment in the in the inkjet, had uh, actually eight Litho presses. Uh, but part of the inkjet investment was to replace uh, certainly four of those. Um, so as things stand, we have four Litho presses. Um, the inkjet press, we have one uh, T250 at the moment. And um, this isn't playing, so I'm not sure if this is meant to be sort of a video or whether it's going to be a series of stills ah it's supposed to be a video clip i can see running ah do you uh, see it alex I mean, for me yes it's, it's... i can yes i ah. can see it running oh, so fine. we're just looking at a chap on his guillotine at the moment oh good okay well i'm not seeing that so unfortunately all i see is the is the litho press hall but um yeah good good that obviously you, you you're getting a you know a view of the the solar press business there um and is that it now done stephen yeah, I think so. Okay. And I hope that uh, I think we're live on. It, yeah, we are live. If you, just, if you just refresh your browser, uh, Simon, then you basically yep. will probably get things back again. So, uh, yeah, you don't have to log out. Just refresh the browser. Okay. And I hope, um, Morton, that, that people were seeing the video and hearing Simon's commentary. Is that? They did, 100%. I am That's checking great. that. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So um, before we, we get to Simon and talk about his experience, I just wanted to, to ask Alex, you know, one question. So you're someone who um, is out and about in the market all over um, EMEA, you know, Europe and beyond. And just to, to get your view um, on the commercial print market, where we stand and, you know, what's happening. And yeah. So market. thank you. Thanks, Stephen. So I just wanted to run over a, a couple of slides really perhaps to just help create a, a, a bit of a picture for why we felt that this session was 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 valuable and and perhaps to give a bit of a context to to, to why simon and, and uh, solo press moved into into the world of inkjet and the two slides are, are, are mostly talking about the trend that we see in the commercial print market so this is to do with digital in it in its totality so not just inkjet and as we know the the commercial business has been moving slowly well not even slowly you know continuously with digital and typically on the the, the touch sheet side of the business but as we see from this slide as things have kind of been gently progressing we now see in terms of the number of pages we very much sit on a tipping point to where we're going to see an awful lot more jobs start to go digital and that is really because of the progress that we've seen within inkjet and perhaps the more interesting slide for, for those that are end users and customers on the call, you know, in terms of where we really see the profit dollars and margin and the potential, you know, now it really is coming over from digital. So, so we within HP and also a number of our, our competitors, of course, have really been focusing on Inkjet, trying to get it to a status where it's addressable within this market to, to, to really drive the value for for customers and we believe and uh, we'll, we'll let Simon uh, do the talking but that we've really reached now this this point where where inkjet is addressable for for the commercial market okay thanks very much Alex and maybe then the first question to to Simon is really just to follow up on on that um, you know Simon obviously you're um, a particular kind of uh, commercial print, so you're a web to print company, as you as you covered. Um, you know, tell us a, in a bit about you know, where you see the the, the market today, and the, you know some of the challenges that, that you've been facing. Yeah, sure. So I think the challenge for you know for for all print businesses in the first instance is to is to generate demand, to you know to generate um, customers and, and and volume and interest in in your business. Um, Solar press, in many ways, kind of crack that nut uh, by creating an e-commerce platform. Uh, and so we, we acquire our customers through the online uh, portal and, and obviously sell our products to those customers through the online portal. Um, and this has a couple of benefits. One is that it strips out a lot of uh, administrative cost and complexity. Um, so effectively the customer is, uh, you know, is doing a lot of the admin work that typically would be done uh, in-house otherwise by kind of account managers. 
That's not to say that we don't offer that service. We do, but it's really about serving the customer in the way that they choose and would like to be served. Uh, and many people would like to do it themselves. And, and we see significant volumes of orders coming through overnight and on weekends. So that's kind of testament to the fact that many customers are, are quite happy to, uh, you know, carry that process out themselves. Uh, but the other benefit of e-commerce and selling online is that you're able to uh, guide the customer to a set of choices, um, a relatively narrow range of choices. I mean, there are millions of combinations of, of products that you can select from uh, and, and print with SolarPress, but you are driving them down a relatively narrow uh, range of products. Um, and so this means that you can do some aggregation in production uh, and SolarPress has been doing aggregation of, of print jobs for, for quite some time by uh, creating gangs and, and producing them on LIFO. Um, and also, you know, very short run work on, on digital. So I started saying uh, when I couldn't see the, the video that was playing, so I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what everyone was seeing, but um, we had eight litho presses at the, at the beginning of this journey, uh, as well as seven digital small, you know, small cut sheet digital presses. Uh, those were Xerox uh, iGens. Um, and uh, in April 2019, we invested in a couple of B2 Indigo presses, uh, and we also have some wide formats. So we have some Agfa Annapurnas, uh, which are which are hybrid machines. Um, and yeah, so you know the the, the, the challenge that uh, the commercial printers have, uh, in in my view, is is generating demand. Um, and that's something that through the business model that we have, we've been able to uh, do reasonably effectively, although we might come on to some of the more recent challenges later on. Okay. Very good. And um, if we talk just about Inkjet, Simon, where did you see the opportunity coming for your business? Yeah, so once you've Kind of crack that nut of of generating significant de demand and also hopefully um, through a relatively narrow range of products. And I'm not saying that's for everybody. Obviously, there are other other business models where maybe you're perhaps uh, more focused on the on the niche offerings. But uh, for us, we've always been uh, a business that's looked for the for the volume opportunities. Um, so once you have that, once you have significant demand, you're looking at the ways in which you can uh, produce that that volume uh, most effectively. And, and as I said, we were uh, litho and, and cut sheet small digital, um, but constantly looking at and considering, you know, what is the direction the market's moving in, uh, what opportunities exist in terms of new technology. Um, and I would say that's a constant pursuit. And, and I'm sure that sounds very familiar to anyone on the call that's from the printing industry, you spend your life uh, thinking about how you can do things uh, more efficiently. Um, and so where, where Inkjet came in, obviously, um, you know, we've, we and I have been observing that technology for, for many years. Um, and we had already employed it to, to quite good effect in, uh, in the wide format department. So, you know, good quality, but very, very short run, uh, almost individual items uh, being produced in, in that department. And I think the question was, when will, well, I think initially, if, you know, will, will there ever be a moment where that technology is able to produce at that high speed, uh, the quality that's necessary for the commercial print industry? Um, and that's something we've been uh, watching closely and, uh, uh, you know, curious to see whether it ever would reach that, uh, that tipping point. Um, it was clear that if it could reach that tipping point, well, then there was some maths to be done to, to make sure that with the cost of the inks uh, and the productivity gains that you could have by producing uh, on a high speed continuous inkjet press, you know, would it make sense to, to make a significant investment in that in that direction? But I think the big prerequisite was can it achieve the correct quality? And, and certainly as I'd observed that technology uh, over the years, it, you know, it was a long way short of what the uh, commercial print industry would need. Um, but just over a year ago, um, time's flown because yeah, this last year we've all been locked up in our, uh, in our houses more or less. But um, you know, just over a year ago, we started looking uh, quite seriously, looked at a number of vendors, um, I, I think three vendors that we felt did have uh, the, the quality that would be required, although it still felt like a bit of a gamble. It was definitely different uh, to the quality that we were used to certainly from litho production, um, but we were seeing something that was close, something that was comparable. Um, and then, yeah, we started doing, you know, the analysis. D does it make sense? Uh, you know, is it is it gonna be less costly to produce work in this way? 
Uh, can we get the workflow to work? Uh, you know, what's it going to be like running off of reels uh, and so on? And so we did a significant amount of due diligence looking at the different uh, technologies until, uh, you know, gradually, I would say, convincing ourselves that it, it could make sense for our business and in our industry. Okay. And, and Simon, you know, tell us about some of the criteria that you were using as you were evaluating these these different solutions clearly you know quality was one you've already mentioned that but but but, but how were you looking at the different solutions on offer yeah so i think you know certainly uh, quality was you know what you might call uh, sort of table stakes i think without that it was a non starter um so we spent a lot of energy looking at uh, looking at that in the first instance um, and I think it's worth noting at that point, the only technology that was on offer from HP was the T240. Um, and our perspective was that the quality uh, from that technology was not ready, was not right for the for the market. So I think um, yeah, coated stocks, right? I guess. It just, yeah, we, it yeah. was it was it was necessary for us, again, for the costing model as well, to be able to run on on standard offset um, stocks, uh, you know, which was not a possibility. Also, we didn't find the color saturation. Uh, was where it needed to be uh, certainly for our customers and the expectations that we've created if you like over time through uh, litho and cut sheet uh, digital uh, production so that was that was critical that was you know as, as i say table stakes um the other things that were um, important for us were total cost of ownership so um you know making sure that we re really understood that cost model it's it's a bit of a leap into the unknown, relatively speaking, because certainly with uh, with cut sheet digital, we're, we're used to having a click price. Um, and so, you know, there aren't really very many variables. You, you kind of understand what your costs are going to be per product. You have to bear in mind that with SolarPress, we're not quoting a job on site. We don't speak to a customer, understand what the product is that they want to order and give them a, a tailored price. Um, we're creating using sort of aggregation, um, a set of pricing that we we um, that we portray to a customer online and it's it's up to them to select the product and, and pay the price that we're charging. We have no idea at that point what they're gonna print with us uh, other than it will be A5 in size and it'll be double-sided for instance. Um, how much ink is on that product, we don't know until we start producing it. So um, uh, needing to really understand that our costs would vary quite dramatically in, in production dependent on the level of ink coverage, um, you know, was a bit of a tricky, you know, tricky conundrum and, and we needed to run lots and lots of models using typical work um, uh, from our business um, in order to understand what the average ink consumption is for the typical kind of work that we produce um, uh, so that we could establish, you know, what, what the costs would be. So, so anyway you know, to answer your question, figuring out uh, what the costs were, but not just the, the specific variable costs, but the overall, um, uh, you know, ownership costs in terms of energy consumption and, and, and costs around that, any kind of consumables, uh, any any training costs, any uh, servicing costs and, and, and so on. So that that was a big factor. Uh, and, and we compared a number of different vendors on that on that front. There was another element which was wouldn't imagine unique to us, but because we had uh, seven cut sheet uh, uh, iGen, uh, Xerox iGen presses at that point, uh, we were considering how we could uh, move more in the direction of Indigo. We'd already invested in the B2 uh, Indigos. Um, and, you know, those iGen presses were, were reaching the end of life. So we, we knew that we needed to replace them. Uh, and it was really handy and helpful for us that HP also had a solution in, in that direction. We already had a a strong relationship, um, you know, I, I didn't point out at the beginning of this, but we're part of uh, a fairly large uh, group. So uh, Solar Press's local revenues are 30 million, but the overall group revenue, and, and it's called the Online Printers Group, is, is around 240 million. Um, and in Europe, we, we were printing a lot with, with Indigo. So, you know, it, it, you know, having some kind of a solution to the cut sheet challenge for us um, in, in terms of digital printing was also critical. So that was another factor. Um, another one was uh, space. So one of the big motivations for the move uh, and the investment uh, in Inkjet was that we'd really run out of capacity uh, and we'd run out of space, like actual real estate space. Uh, and so we were facing uh, if we continued to manufacture in the way that we had previously, we really needed to move into new premises. Um, 
And so the, the challenge in many ways was, is there some way that we can remain in the same premises, gain more capacity uh, and be more efficient? Um, and really finding inkjet was, was the solution to all of those um, challenges. So space was another, was another big factor. So I think that's it, kind of quality, total cost of ownership. Um, uh, uh, I've already forgotten one of mine, and <laughs> space was the final one, but I've forgotten the third one. So, Simon, one of, one of the questions I want to ask is that um, one of the things that we discussed and also we discussed with a lot of customers who are, are, are running through a similar criteria, a similar mindset to yourself, is that they often come from a cut sheet production facility and of course at the moment a, a large amount of the particularly high production inkjet solutions are web fed so would you mind perhaps just talking through your process perhaps some of the steps you went through in terms of that journey from cut sheet to web and, and anything that you kind of learned along the journey that might might help people who are, are going yeah. through similar thoughts yeah i think i sometimes use a really terrible analogy here i'm sort of uh, debating whether to whether to go with this one but um <laughs> when it uh, when, when when it comes to um you know running on reels you're right that was definitely a uh, you know a concern in the in the first instance just because of mm. what you're used to you you know you don't know what you don't know and if you've never been involved in in producing off of off of webs then uh, there's a there's a kind of fear factor there and so certainly in the early stages, that was something that we were thinking, wow, that's going to be complex. You know, how do we do that? We're, we're going to have to figure out a different, you know, we, we buy our paper from the mill and we keep it in stock. So we have to figure out something different there. We have to figure out how we're going to handle that paper. Um, and, you know, so, so there were, there were kind of concerns. And then, you know, right, then we have to convert from reels into cut sheets so that, so that we can do any finishing. So, how do we do that? What does that process look like? What technology do we do we need, and so on? So, I'd say in the in the early stages, it felt just as you've described it, like a barrier, something that uh, we should be concerned with. Um, you know that uh, you know if, if I guess if 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 you wanted to play it safe, it, it probably wouldn't be uh, uh, something you'd get involved in. But I think the transition, the the realization that actually this is a better way of producing work happens pretty quickly and it certainly happened quickly for us so um uh, we went and obviously uh you know had a few demos watched the technology in action but we also went to a few uh, printers that were printing off of reels uh, we we're fortunate that in the group um there's a business in in denmark actually they do their inkjet production in poland so uh, one of the brands uh, as, as part of the group is the scandinavian print group uh, laser trick is what is one of the brands uh, under that banner and they produce in in poland so that's that's part of the group i was able to go out there and watch them producing off of reels and and start to understand um you know what that journey is is like so i think that really helped to kind of see it in action and and realize that it's that it's not a, you know as big a challenge as it maybe at first appears and then actually you know the the, the transition was complete when i realized you know, this is a better way of producing things. This is actually an awful lot easier. Um, there's a lot of complexity involved in uh, getting cut sheets into any kind of machine and and managing that paper path through the machine. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the downtime that uh, businesses, printing businesses experience is related to, you know, to those challenges. So printing off of a reel immediately makes, uh, you know, that challenge, uh, you know, less cumbersome, let's say. Um, and then watching, you know, and understanding how you can convert from reels into finished products at extremely high speed uh, was just like an epiphany, uh, to be honest. And, you know, as I said, we were looking to use less real estate space, uh, but gain uh, capacity. And one of the challenges that, that we had, uh, you know, as a business that had grown up from nothing 20 years ago, uh, you know, a couple of guys starting out a printing business uh, to, to being a 30 million turnover company with you know two and a half thousand orders on average a day uh, being being processed through the company we'd expanded on the on the industrial estate that um, that the business actually started in uh, into into different units and so we were printing in one unit and finishing in another so we needed to uh, kind of print work allow it to dry a little bit and then cart it down to to the finishing unit uh, what we were able to do with the inkjet 
um, is have some near line finishing. So we print on the one side of the room and move it across to the other side of the room and do the finishing. And, and actually that gained us an awful lot of time. Um, and that's hugely beneficial for a business like ours that has built its reputation on being fast. So uh, our um, maxim is, is print delivered tomorrow. And the idea is that 75% of orders that come in uh, on this day will be dispatched tonight and with, with customers tomorrow. We have a 12 p.m. cutoff. Actually, we also have a 5 p.m. cutoff. So that means the vast majority of orders are coming in at, at noon and need to be out that evening to, to arrive with customers the next day. And so little bits of downtime, like allowing a, a, a stack of litho work to, to dry before strapping it and moving it to the finishing, before unstrapping it and starting the finishing process, um, we calculated we probably gained ourselves about three hours, which, which is not far off gaining us an extra 50% of real production time on, on a daily basis, uh, which was just phenomenal. Um, and, you know, you're, pr you're printing, uh, you know, the product's coming off dry and you're able to just move it across the room and start the finishing process and uh, much, much less uh, labor involved in that um, and much less time involved. Um, and because of the speed of the, uh, you know, of the, of the print production, um, you know, we're, we're getting an awful lot more work per employee, if you like, uh, produced per hour. So, yeah, um, you, you know, your, your, your question was more about, you know, specifically printing on reels, but actually, you know, is, is that a barrier yeah. for us? Not at all. I, th I think there's a sort of little mental leap that, uh, that people need to make. Um, but once you've kind of made that, that leap, um, then actually you realize there are lots of benefits involved. And so now I look at, you know, technology that's printing on, on cut sheets and think, why would you do that? You know, why would you go to that effort? And now it's really clear and obvious when, uh, you know, s some businesses are producing, uh, you know, doing sort of jobbing work, every, every product might be different on a different substrate and, and so on. And, and for those types of businesses, then, you know, cut sheet makes absolute sense. But when you have a significant volume, um, uh, you know, of a specific substrate as we do, then the best thing is to be able to queue up those jobs, load up the paper and run off all the jobs that you have on, on that, yeah, you know, on that media in the most efficient way. And so Inkjet enables us to do that. Okay. Well, thanks. thanks very much for that, Simon. So just about the, the press itself. So you selected HP, um, installed a couple of indigo presses, as you said, and then we installed the, the inkjet, um, actually the, the very first T250 um, in the world. We actually had to install the press as a, as a T240 HD and upgrade it in your facility to become a T250 with the brilliant inks, which the, you know, the, those inks, of course, are able to print on, on the coated stocks. Uh, tell us a bit of, about your experience with the with the press so far, I think you've had it as a T250 since about last August. Um, so tell us a bit about it. I'm just going to run a, a video clip as you as you talk. Sure. So yeah, I mean, um, I think putting some new technology in during COVID, uh, you know, was was quite challenging, uh, challenging for for us, but probably even more challenging uh, for HP. You know, with this being new you know new technology um you know developed in the us and then being installed in the in the uk i think there were there were some challenges for the hp team in terms of not being able to travel and so on so we had to do lots of things remotely um i think it was a you know a challenge but also a blessing i think the blessing i can't almost believe i'm saying this but under covid circumstances demand levels have definitely been lower than they would typically be uh, and that's that's probably an understatement um and that meant that we weren't under the same kind of pressure that we would normally be um, to, to produce live work. And so we were able to commit the time that was needed to, to introduce completely new technology into our business, train up our team members, uh, you know, and get them uh, competent on, on that technology. So, um, yeah, as you say, it came in as a T240. That, that was an opportunity for us to train the operators and so on. Then, then it got upgraded to the T250. And, and the big challenge there was, like, can we get, you know, can we produce on the substrates that we need to produce on? Standard offset coated stocks, as you said, uh, which is, I think, probably 90% of what we're producing through, through the press. Um, and, can, you know, can we get that to the, to the right quality? Um, and I think this is, you know, Morton said at the beginning about uh, the technology exceeding our expectations. So, you know, I would say even at the point that I put this 
technology in, I was very concerned that the quality would not reach uh, the expectation. You know, I'd seen enough samples, but I think there's oftentimes a big difference between what you can create in a sort of, let's say, lab conditions versus what you can actually create in in real uh, live you know, commercial production environment. Um, and uh, you know, again, to you know, to Alex's uh, question and, and Morton's point at the beginning, uh, that you know, the technology has exceeded our expectation. We monitor as a business all of the quality failures we have according to every technology we produce produce on, uh, and every substrate that we produce on, and so on. So we can really drill down and understand where where complaints are coming from in the business. And the complaint rate for anything produced on the inkjet is as low as the next best. Well, actually, they're on a par with each other, which is Litho. Uh, and actually better. So we have less complaints for work produced on uh, on the inkjet than we do, for instance, on the cut sheet digital. So that would be the Xerox or the, I, uh, sorry, the, the iGens or the Indigos. Um, and uh, also less than we see uh, through the wide format department. So yeah, um, that's, 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 been, you know, that was a huge relief, I would say, but, but then also, you know, you know, very pleasant surprise in the end that, uh, that the, the way the quality has been perceived by our customers, um, you know, has been a step up from, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we were producing before. So, so yeah, very, very satisfying. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, our, our team members, so the, the, the people that we trained on the technology were ex litho minders. They'd been actually running the oldest presses that we had, which were um, really the old technology, the pre XL press technology from Heidelberg. Um, so these are guys that have been litho print operators for uh, decades um, and we retrained them on, onto the inkjets or I should say HP retrained them on, onto the inkjets and they've really taken to it like ducks to water, uh, uh, you know, clearly enjoying the, the challenge um, uh, but also doing exceptionally well with it. And I think it was the right decision to move litho uh, print operators across because you know, there are some variables that need to be managed. Um, uh, trying to get the, the right balance uh, between um, the amount of, I'm, I don't want to use the wrong word, I'm, I'm about to call it primer, but it's not optimizer, to, to lay down the right amount of optimizer and get the ink right and get the heat right on the dryers and get the uh, moisture right on the on the remoisturing uh, unit, uh, and and then being able to also master the finishing, so we have the same operators running the the printing press as we do the finishing. Uh, you know that's 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 a that's a technical challenge, and I think it benefits to have people that are uh, very technically minded rather than oftentimes with uh, certainly with 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 Xeroxes, it's more of a sort of green button technology and when it goes wrong you ask a, a you know an engineer to come and, and solve the problem uh, HP's philosophy which we see is the same on the inkjet as it has been on the on the indigo is really to get our operators to be able to solve their own challenges um, and so you need the right types of operators and I think we've we've achieved that very good, very good. So I, mean, I, I want to pick up on a, a particular point in that, uh, sort of building on the story. So you had your things that were important to you when you were analysing the machine. Now you've got the machine, and if we sort of take an assumption that it, it, it now matches what you need and the GCP market, I think there's a very important part of that process as well, which is sort of what goes before and after the machine, right? So with the workflow yeah. and the finishing. So again, perhaps you would just be happy to talk through what you looked at, what was important, mm. and you know why those complement. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, yeah. So Solar Press was a business doing things slightly differently to to the rest of the the market. Certainly in the in the early days, uh, it was you know one of the early adopters of, of e commerce printing, uh, and one of these early adopters of uh, job aggregation. And as a result, we built our own workflow system. So you know we have our own developers, and we have a, a proprietary system that's uh, that's been developed in house. Uh, and that's because there was nothing, uh, certainly at the time, that that it was needed that uh, was available off the shelf that would achieve the things that uh, that we needed, being being the type of business we we are with the unique challenges that we had. So when it came to Inkjet, it was you know our approach initially was was going to be much the same. Okay, well we'll we'll build a workflow and we'll figure out how to get the work batched and and to the press and and, and produce in in the most efficient way. Um, but it, then it became apparent that, uh, you know, fairly obviously, I suppose, that 
um, the businesses that were selling this technology. It also developed some uh, some workflow uh, solutions. Uh, so one of those, for, you know, from HP is SiteFlow. Um, you know, I know a little bit about the background of, of SiteFlow um, and, and the history of that uh, of that software and that technology. And I've I would say much like I have with uh, with Inkjet, I've been watching that development over time and, and wondering, you know, when might it be ready for, for a business like ours? Uh, and the and the tipping point was really with uh, with this Inkjet introduction. So instead of us taking the time to develop our own uh, solution, um, uh, we ultimately opted to, to take SideFlow as a, as a solution. I'm, and I'm really pleased that we did. I think it saved us an awful lot of time and energy. Um, and means that we're we're now actually running all of our digital workflow through through SiteFlow. We're still running our traditional um, uh, proprietary uh, uh, sort of software for, for for workflow management for the Litho and um, wide format side of the business. But all of digital and uh, and Inkjet is coming through uh, coming through SiteFlow. And so, you know what that literally means in in the perfect scenario and doesn't always work this way but in the perfect scenario a customer can place an order online proof their order themselves sign that off uh, and that job then doesn't need to to touch uh, or have any human intervention on our side um, it goes through the side flow system gets uh, batched and and sent to the press ready for print production so the first human involvement if you like is is starting to run that batch of uh, you know of print jobs and the first time somebody actually touches the the work, if you like, is as they're taking it off the back of the finishing machine to put it in a box and, and label it and send it to the customer. Um, we still use our own proprietary software um, for the for the management of the finishing and the dispatch process, um, but it's conceivable at some point in the future that we could uh, migrate that element over to, to SideFlow as well. Um, I think that the challenge for us is, you know, when, when you've spent, the number of years we have developing our own proprietary software, then uh, there are certain unique and bespoke things that you've developed within that software that are particular to your needs. Uh, and so there are you know, still some gaps as we look at, uh, you know, a, a software like SiteFlow. But um, I think it's conceivable with the with the amount of development that's happening in that uh, in that software and that technology that at some point in the future, it could, you know, cater for all of our needs. So, yeah, work, you know, workflow. Um, a big challenge, something that uh, that uh, you know anyone that's interested in this technology will need to spend time uh, uh, contemplating. Um, but now, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to use my bad analogy. I'm, I'm going to have to. I, it's, it's too tempting. So, it's, um, I, I've got an electric car, and um, the, the the first time I, I I took it for a test drive, it just you know the the kind of penny drop that this is just clearly and obviously the future. Um, and and when you think about it. What's fantastic about regular vehicles uh, is that we've managed to take an incredibly complex process, you know, a, a combustion engine. So mm -hmm. let's inject some fuel into a chamber and ignite it and push a piston and, and make this vehicle move forward. Uh, uh, and we've made it seem relatively seamless, but it's still extremely uh, complex. And then you get in an electric car and there's a kind of battery and it drives the wheels and, 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 the, and the car moves forward and you think, wow, this is just easy. You don't even need the brake. You just kind of feather on the throttle on and off and, and so on. And when I look at our business, we've done extremely well at taking a very, very complex process. So receiving customers' orders, kind of pre-flighting that, working out what grid we want to produce, getting the jobs onto a grid, um, you know, sending those jobs to, uh, to, to, you know, to an image setter to make the plates, moving those plates from, you know, from that room out to a press room, having a, an operator physically mount those plates on the press, run some sheets through, make sure the things are in register, that your color's right, that, uh, you know, everything is as, as it should be, uh, you know, using up lots of waste paper in the process and then finally get on the run. And then you're not done. You still need to wait for that to, to dry. In certain instances, we were running the presses we've replaced, the simplex presses, the presses that we still have are perfecting presses on the litho side. But if you're doing it simplex, you're then printing one side. You need some time for that to dry. You then turn it over. You put it back in the machine. You start, you know, the process all over, all over again. Uh, and then you need some drying time. And you move it to finishing, and you, you know, you start unloading, you know, stack by stack onto a guillotine or some some finishing device to uh, to produce that job. Now we'd made that as as seamless as you possibly can, and I think we we're extremely efficient at at, at doing that. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a very very complex process. 
Mm. And then you kind of, you, you enter the 21st century and you have this automated workflow and jobs are just queuing up on the press and then you load up a reel of paper and out the other end comes a reel of paper. It's not quite as simple as that. Like I said before, there's, there's an operator and they need to be skilled in understanding uh, what needs to happen. But, mm. you know, in relative terms, that's a, a whole lot simpler than all those other steps that I, that I just described. And then the paper comes off dry. You move it across the room, put it in a machine. You know, we use the Hunter technology and I think we might talk about that in a sec, but, you know, you move it across, stick it in the in the hungler and out the other end. You know, if it's just a cut sheet product, comes your finished product and you put it in a box, um, you know, and that's all happening at extremely high speed. And so it's a similar, you know, it's a, it's, it's a similar kind of epiphany where you just go, wow, this this absolutely just is better and is clearly the future. Mm. OK, um, but Simon, at the same time you acquire the inkjet press, you you um, acquired another a couple of indigo presses. You already had some some indigo, so you clearly see those two solutions as complementary in your in your business. Can you tell us a little bit how you, how you deploy those two technologies and um, yeah provide the workout? Yeah, and and we still have Litho, and we still think there's you know there's there's a good place for Litho in, in our business. So yeah, well, the way it works for us is inkjet is you know, the, the sausage factory, so to speak, when, when we have a high volume of uh, products on a common substrate, you can aggregate batch and produce those all, all together at the same time. Where indigo is very useful is when you have um, a thicker substrate, so card, uh, you, know, um, you know, board weight materials, uh, also, you know, diverse materials. So we print on craft papers and so on, uh, which, which you would never... Uh, think of putting through the inkjet or not at this moment in time, you, you wouldn't. The, the the barrier with with inkjet is um, there's some time and energy and, and waste paper involved in in webbing up a new reel of, of paper. So if you're going to put a specific substrate on, you need to be printing for a, for a significant amount of time. Our goal is to put a reel of paper on and, and run that entire reel uh, until it's finished and only web up when, we, when we've run out of paper, uh, basically. We don't always achieve that, but that's what we're trying to get to. Um, so that then doesn't make sense. If you want to sell, you know, a more diverse range of products, which we do, um, you need a, a cut sheet machine where you can, you know, take a, a small packet of paper and load it in the machine very quickly, not use up really any waste in, in getting your first, um, uh, uh kind of uh, good quality sheet out of the machine and then, you know, just run that job and then move on to the next substrate and the next substrate and the next substrate. So, Indigo is, is critical for us, uh, certainly for board weights, but also for any diverse uh, products uh, uh, where we don't have massive demand. Um, it's also useful for kind of mopping up. So, you know, we have a cutoff point where we say, right, you know, that's a batch that's ready to go. Uh, but later on, I did also mention that we have a 5 p.m. cutoff. So we might get some orders at, at 5 p.m. on the same substrate and we've already uh, put the batch in and run that batch off on, on the inkjet. So for those, it's perfect to be able to go um, then to the to the indigos to to run those off. So that's pretty much how we how we decide uh, between inkjet and indigo. Uh, and then the decision between litho and uh, inkjet or indigo is you know is is really volume based. Um, I think uh, at some point later on, we'll certainly look to get. Um, a little more advanced in our selection criteria. At the moment, we've we've set quantity breaks based on our uh, average um, ink uh, coverage. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at a at a range of jobs and working out what what the average ink coverage is, uh, we decide what the quantity break should be for products going to the inkjet, for instance. And then above a certain quantity break, we we move towards litho. Um, in the future, I guess we'd like to also analyze, well, what is the actual in coverage of this job? And does it therefore at this quantity make sense to go to that technology? We're not doing that yet. Um, and nor do we really have to, but that would be, I guess, uh, uh, you know, a way of maximizing margin. Um, at this point in time, the costs that we expected to see on average are the costs that we are seeing on average uh, from, from the inkjet. So yeah, uh, you know, I still think it's, you know, th th there's no chance that a business like ours could say, uh, actually, this continuous um, high-speed continuous feeding jet is a complete replacement for for what we're doing. It's it's not there at the moment. You need these, uh, you know, complementary technologies. Very good. So final question from me, Simon, because I'm sure we'll have some questions. Really, it's a, a bit of a general question then. So you've made the investment, Inkjet, Indigo, you've got your Litho, you've got your iGens. 
where do you see as the, the future for the solo press as we come out of this pandemic? What what does the future hold for you? Yeah. Yes, I mean the yeah, you know, the pandemic has been massively um uh, challenging for, for our business. Uh you know, certainly demand levels have been uh you know massively suppressed. We've we've had a couple of high points along the way, but but mostly it's been suppressed for the last uh eleven months or so. Um What's the future? So one of the reasons that we invested in Inkjet or, you know, one of the um, opportunities off the back of investing in Inkjet is to get involved in producing work in the publishing sector. So one of the, I would say the beauties, uh, but also the the unique challenges that we've had in recent times as a business is um, the, the relative simplicity of our business model. Um, so, you know, we're, we're online, we're e-commerce. Um, that's our play. That's our, that, you know, that's the market that we serve. That's the way that we attract our customers and so on. And, and that means as a business, we can be extremely uh, efficient, but it also means when, you know, to, to, to make our business thrive, we need a, a thriving economy. We need people out and about and doing things and getting together and going to events and going to shows and, and so on. And, and, and it's really that activity that, uh, drives demand for us. And so, you know, we've seen a, a, a massive drop off in, in, in demand. Whereas we know that there are some sectors and some businesses that have been, uh, better protected against this downturn and, and publishing is, is actually one of them. Uh, also the kind of photo gifting market is, a, is another. Uh, so anyway, we recognize that there's an opportunity for us to add another string to the bow and, and get involved in the, in the publishing sector. So that's, uh, that's a direction that we're diversifying into. Um, another one is that we, uh, during the pandemic, launched uh, what we've called Solo Pro, and it's, uh, you know, the, the offering we had before was uh, we're an e-commerce platform, uh, you know, we attract customers to that platform, they order the product, and we produce it uh, for them. Uh, what, what we now have with Solo Pro is... Um, more of a sort of concierge service, you know, very, very uh, skilled and experienced team members that will deal with the customer and, and provide them products that perhaps aren't uh, immediately available on the online. Uh, we'll also be able to provide them discounts, uh, you know, to, to really reward the um, higher spend levels that they have and, and so on. And so, you know, it, uh, Solar Press used to be a sort of one size fits all, but now we're really saying actually there's there are bigger businesses and resellers and so on that we want to be able to service more effectively. And so we've, we've launched that and we're developing that. Uh, and then I would say there's this constant kind of drive towards adding uh, more products. So, you know, serving more and more of those customers needs when, when they do find us, we want to be able to take care of um, the, the full array of needs that they have. And, uh, you know, we, we're offering uh, merchandising products, promotional products. Um, so, so that's an area that we see growing in the future. Um, you know, stickers and labels is, is an area that, um, uh, you know, we've seen grow over the last year and we would expect that to continue and we're going to keep focused on that. Uh, packaging is an area that, um, you know, we're, we're really not involved in, but, but are planning on, on diversifying into. Um, you know, part of that, our DNA, if you like, is, is to be able to rapidly add new products. And we did that to great effect during coronavirus by, by producing lots and lots of products that weren't part of the, offering pre-pandemic, um, but we recognized that, um, you know, that there would be demand for, for some things that, that we could certainly fill with the technology that, that we had. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think um, the future is, a little, you know, more of what we're doing and, and already doing well and, and trying to get better at that. Um, so we're redeveloping our, our website, um, but also then the opportunity to diversify into new product areas and uh, new product opportunities. Fantastic, gentlemen. Um, sorry to interrupt this very interesting Q and A session here, but it's we have actually uh, an audience, and they are actually asking questions. So I thought that it might be time before the hour to actually involve some of these uh, people here. Uh, the first question actually came as a private message, and that is because they appreciated your presentation so much, Alex. So they ask if it can be delivered as a uh, if we can send it as an email afterwards. How how is that? Can we do that? Uh, yes, I think that should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was uh, so uh, to to people here. Uh, I will send it to everybody in the audience just after this session, so you can have uh, Alex's wonderful presentation. Uh, let's take it directly into the questions. Uh, I take the first one, and then Gene can take the next one. The first one is from uh, Paul Sherfield, and he's asking, uh, "What is the color gamut compared to offset and alter T series presses?" 
think that maybe that's a good the HP question, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, who wants to take uh, take on that? I think I think that maybe Paul is also referring to that uh, with the with the brilliant inks that basically you get a much better color. So maybe that also influenced by the gamut, or how is that? Yeah, I can try to answer that from a, from an HP perspective, um, and it's true that the the brilliant inks uh, the, the, the the gamut is significantly extended versus the. The, the the previous generation of inks, the, the A50 inks that you found on, on the TT40s. Uh, so where we're at now, we have a, a, a color volume that exceeds the um, the Fogra standard. So in, in size, it's the, the overlap is not 100% complete. So there are a couple of very small dark corners of the Fogra um, ga- uh, gamut range that you can't hit, but the, at the same time, there's a, a, a large gamut volume outside of the, the Fogger range you can also hit. Mm. But I, I mean, I, I'll turn the question over to, to Simon. I don't know if you're able to, you know, to comment on how you would, would see the, you know, the, the colors versus, you know, offset, and maybe also the once you went from the T240 inks to the T250, whether you saw. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah. I'm not sure I can directly answer um, Paul's question, but um, certainly fr- from our perspective, the uh, the colours are um, uh, you know enriched, so they're they're, they're punchy, uh, uh, bright and vibrant colours uh, that that you would expect uh, if if you were producing litho. The the resolution is uh, extremely high, so the the definition is is good. Um, you know, there's clear contrast in in images. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of the, the noise that we'd seen in sort of, uh, you know, grayscales and kind of half tones and, and so on, uh, we, we're not seeing uh, with this with this technology now. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm not super technical, but I can certainly say that our customers appreciate it uh, looking, you know, I've, I've spent a whole lifetime in the in the print industry looking at uh, printed products and and. I know good quality when I see it, uh, and, and this certainly sits in that in that um, in that sort of area. Perfect, Jean? Great. David Pumati wants to know: Is the what is the configuration of this T two fifty press, including auxiliaries? Uh, so we have uh, we have the Hunkler unwinder and rewinder. Uh, there's a there's a Wico remoisturing unit. Uh, other than that, it's it's really the the, the T two fifty technology with the with the standard dryers that, that come with the technology, and then the near line finishing we have as well is 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 a Hunkler Gen eight. So it's roll to cut sheet uh, finishing running at uh, well high speed. Let's say one eight one eighty meters a minute uh, typically. Perfect. Let's move on to something that you have actually touched upon in your presentation, and it's from Henry Christiansen. He's asking, how do you evaluate the inkjet technology versus the indigo technology? Yeah, I, th- I mean, they're different, but I certainly, um, so we were asked recently whether we could uh, quote something on indigo because the customer was particularly con- concerned with uh, with quality uh, in, instead of inkjet. And actually, my advice was that you need not be concerned basically and and that it makes sense to go with the the, the most cost effective option because in terms of uh, quality in in my opinion uh you know th- there might be some very particular a- applications but uh you know for, for for general kind of book work and commercial print work there's there's really no degradation between indigo and an inkjet and as i said actually we get less complaints for work produced on the inkjet um, and a lot of that is to do with the sort of um uh, ink adhesion uh, to the material, which, you know, which is sometimes uh, challenging on on the indigo. We don't see the same problem on the inkjet. So on that, on that though, do you obviously if guys are ordering online from you? Do you give them a choice of? I, I know you you've tried to set it up where certain volumes go in a certain way, but <coughs> do they know what it's printed on, or to you that doesn't matter. Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't typically give the choice. Um, I spoke a little bit about solo pro. So a customer yeah. talking to one of our agents there, um, you know, could, could have that dialogue. Actually, this specific opportunity was a publish, a publishing opportunity where, um, uh, we were kind of directly engaged with the customer. They weren't looking at ordering through the website. But confidently, all three, um, equality, all three on all three presses on your Indigos, on your Inkjet, as well as your Lasso, you confident. Yeah. Whatever goes out is acceptable. So that's 100%. great. Yeah, great. exactly right. 
Jamie Walsh, uh, he is actually also a uh, presenter, but uh, only tomorrow. But he has been very active in promoting this uh, thing. Uh, he is asking, what is the main file format used for printing, and how do you optimize those files for output of on the different technologies? That's yeah. a very technical one, right? Uh, it's, that's <laughs> not that's not for me, to be honest. That's not for me. Jamie, but, uh, you're talking to the empty for heaven's sake. He signs the checks, right? That's <laughs> your job, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jean, would you take uh, Bart's question? Yeah, Bart wants about price. Are you um, even competitive in inkjet than in offset? So, I would say that means are you more competitive in inkjet than offset? Yeah, so it's all about those kind of quantity breaks. You know, where does it make more sense? So, obviously, the benefit with LIFO, or let's say the the impediment with LIFO, is that you've got some setup costs. You need to make a set of plates. You need to get the plates on the press. You need to run uh, quite a lot of waste paper through before before you're on the run. Once you're on the run, your variable costs are very low. You've got your paper and very low consumable costs. Um, it's not quite the same with, with inkjet. Uh, actually, the paper is cheaper, so that's a benefit of running off the web, like uh, Alex and I were discussing earlier. Um, but your ink costs are are much much higher than they would be with with litho. So once you cross over a certain uh, run length, um, it it just becomes uncompetitive. But uh, for us, we're you know we've calculated somewhere in the region of thirteen hundred uh, copies is more competitive on inkjet than on uh, than on litho. Okay, I've got a dash to the next session. <laughs> that, that was the fastest that, exit she's from gone. That was a quick leave. <laughs> that was a quick, yeah. So uh, then I have a, an opportunity to ask one more question. Um, uh, so um, uh, Alex and, and uh, Stephen, uh, uh, with this wonderful machine and all the good things, also um, um, uh, Simon has just, just spoken about this past hour. Um, what do you think is the main obstacle for getting more devices out to, to PSPs in the commercial market space? Alex, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I think um, the main challenge for us, I think it's probably a lot of what we've discussed today, Morton. So it's about it's about awareness and an understanding of how it fits into to people's business. Um, Inkjet has been, you know, coming. We've had the last, well, the Drupal that was missed and the Drupal before where people were trying to set it up as a, an Inkjet Drupal. And I don't think the technology was really there for a majority of applications. So people were arguably reviewing it at the wrong time. I think Simon touched on it, but, you know, he's kept a keen eye. There was a lot of testing. So I think it's really about people actually making that step, looking at the hurdles that we've discussed. So things like workflow, media, the actual capabilities of the press and really analyzing, you know, their business and where it fits. And, and, and it won't be a fit for everyone, of course. You know, Simon was, was, was very articulate about you know, where benefits people with a certain number of media, you know, with a certain perhaps turnover. But, but I would say that it, it's, really about, it's really about education and kind of taking that step to perhaps de-myth, de if that's the correct English, some of their concerns. And that was the last word of this session. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I you. really appreciate it. It was a great session, and it was great to involve you, Simon, because that was, again, as I said in, in the first session, you know, having hands-on from people that actually work with the wonderful equipment that HP and others develop is uh, a, an amazing opportunity for everybody to learn from. So thank you very much, gentlemen, and I hope to thank see you. and talk to you soon. Thank you. Great to be involved. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.